welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History. I'm Claire Ridgway of the Tudor Society website and also the Anne Boleyn Files website and author of several books including that one just there. Okay, today I'm taking you back to 1512. Because on this day in Tudor history, the 10th of April 1512, Margaret Tudor, who had become Queen of Scots, eldest daughter of the late King Henry VII and sister of the reigning monarch King Henry VIII of England, obviously, gave birth to a son. And her son was the future James V of Scotland and she gave birth to him at Linlithgow Palace in Scotland. Now, Margaret had married King James IV of Scotland in August 1503 when she was just 13 years of age. Now, little James, who she gave birth to in 1512, was her fourth child and was actually the only one of her children um, from James IV to survive into adulthood. In fact, the others all died as infants. Now, James, um, this little boy who we're talking about today, inherited the crown of Scotland on the 9th of September 1513 and he was just 17 months old when he in inherited the throne. His father was killed when the English defeated the Scots at the Battle of Flodden on the 9th of September 1513. Now James was crowned king at Stirling on the 21st of September 1513. In his will, his father, King James IV, had instructed that Margaret Tudor, who was now Queen of Scots, well, in fact, now Dowager Queen of Scots, should serve as a tutor or a regent to her son while he was in his minority, because, of course, at 17 months of age, he couldn't exactly reign over Scotland, and that she should be helped by a royal council. But Margaret went on to remarry. She remarried um, just a year later in 1514, taking Archibald Douglas, 6th Earl of Angus, as her second husband. So instead of her acting as a regent throughout James's minority, um, John Stuart, Duke of Albany, uh, Albany sorry, stepped in, took over as regent, or rather he was called Lord Governor of the King's Council, but really acting as regent. Now Albany was a little bit of an interesting choice to act as this Lord Governor, to kind of reign um, over Scotland while James was little, because Albany had never actually set foot in Scotland, and he couldn't speak the Scots language either. He'd been brought up in France. And it was the, the lords who were pro-French that kind of approached him and got him to uh, take up this position. And he was actually absent uh, for quite a few times, for a fair period of time during James's minority. And when he was absent in France, he left things in the hands of the King's Council. He left a Regency Council in charge while he was away. Now, in July 1524, while Albany was away in France, Margaret, who is now the Dowager Queen, decided to take advantage of the situation and the fact that the Lord Governor was out of the country. And she erected her son as king in his own right. But obviously he was still a young boy at this stage. So it would be, yes, he'd be reigning in his own right. Laugh, laugh. She would be the one in control. She'd be the regent. However, she had alienated many of the important uh, Scottish lords. So in 1525, her estranged husband, the Earl of Angus, was able to take custody of James and then act as regent for him for the next three years. But only three years, because in May 1528, James was now 16 years of age. And he decided he didn't want someone sort of controlling him, especially not his stepfather. So he managed to escape from uh, Angus's clutches and set about taking control of the country, the government, for himself. He dismissed men who were loyal to Angus 
and replace them with men that would be loyal to him and set about reigning over Scotland in his own right as king. Now, James. He had a very mixed relationship with his uncle, King Henry VIII, from the neighbouring country of England. He made a treaty with England in 1534, but then relations between the countries kind of turned sour and broke down because James went on to marry Madeleine uh, de Valois, who was daughter of King Francis I. Um, he married her in 1537. So that was then an alliance uh, with France and that kind of you know, upset King Henry VIII. Now, this marriage was very short-lived. Madeleine uh, died shortly after her arrival in Scotland, unfortunately. And James went on to marry another woman, but he married another French woman. So, you know, he was staying allied with France. And this woman was Marie de Guise, who was daughter of Claude, Duke of Guise, and he married her in 1538. Now, by 1538, Henry VIII had also, you know, broken with Rome. He'd dissolved the monasteries. And this was a sort of a point of contention between him and James because Henry had broken with the authority of Rome, whereas James was still very much connected to Rome. And Henry VIII had advised James to also break with Rome, but James uh, it totally ignored his uncle's advice and decided to stick with Rome. Now, these two kings, uncle and nephew, um, Henry VIII and James, were supposed to meet in York in sept September 1540. This was while Henry VIII was on his northern progress with Catherine Howard, his fifth wife. And everything was sort of aimed at this meeting that the kings would have in York. But, unfortunately, James stood Henry VIII up, leaving his uncle absolutely furious. Henry then decided that he would ally himself with the Holy Roman uh, Empire, Emperor Charles V, against France. And of course, as Scotland and France were allied, uh, this obviously set England uh, versus Scotland. Um, he sent English forces to the northern borders to prepare for war with Scotland because of this alliance he'd made against France and Scotland was France's you know, traditional ally. There were border raids, there were skirmishes, um, and these culminated in battle, uh, the Battle of Solway Moss on the 24th of November 1542. Now, it is said that Scottish troops numbered somewhere between 15,000 and 18,000 men, and these troops crossed the border into England and met a force of around 3,000 Englishmen led by Thomas Wharton. Now, you would think that, you know, fifteen to 18,000 versus 3,000, oh yeah, Scotland are going to win. But, hmm, although they were far outnumbered, the English troops were victorious. Now, James wasn't actually present at the battle, but news of this defeat was a devastating blow for the Scottish king and not even the birth of his daughter on the 8th of December 1542 could bring him out of his kind of grief and his melancholy that he was feeling after this awful, awful battle. James retired to Falkland Palace and took to his bed with a fever. He died there on the 14th of December 1542. He left the throne to his six-day-old daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots, and he left instructions that Cardinal Beaton and the Earls of Moray, Huntley and Argyle should act as tutors and governors to her while she was in her minority, just as he'd been helped uh, by a Regency Council and advisers when he was in his minority. Now, James actually had two other children by Marie de Guise, 
<coughs> before uh, she gave birth to Mary, Queen of Scots. They were born in 1540 and 1541. But sadly, they both died uh, before they reached the age of one, hence Mary being his heir. He also had nine known illegitimate children, um, including James Stuart, Earl of Moray, and Robert Stuart, Earl of Orkney. And all nine of these children were born to different mothers. So James got around, I think is a polite way of saying it. Now, James Stuart, Earl of Moray, would become Regent of Scotland after the forced abdication of his half-sister, Mary Queen of Scots, in 1567 in favour of her one-year-old son, who became King James VI. And of course, King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England when uh, Queen Elizabeth I, the last of the House of Tudor on the throne of England, died in 1603. So it all ties together. Although I'm talking about a Scottish king here, he was the son of Margaret Tudor, who was the eldest daughter of King Henry the Seventh. Um, he was the nephew of King Henry the Eighth. His daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots, was, of course, Elizabeth I's nemesis. And, of course, Mary, Queen of Scots' son, James VI, became an English king as well. So it all ties in together. So on this day in Tudor history, the 10th of April, 1512, Margaret Tudor gave birth to a little boy who would become King James V of Scotland. I'll be back tomorrow with another Tudor history event. Hmm, I wonder what it could be. An execution, a death, a marriage, baptism, battle. Who knows? Well, I do. But you don't. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>